I would like to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jam Tashan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT. And it's my great pleasure to um, welcome you all to this um, student um, webinar um, in the last of the um, MIT Nano uh, Seminar Series of this semester. And um, our speaker today is going to be Shalu Wei. And um, Shalu is going to talk about um, transformation-induced plasticity and how one can tune uh, nanoscale phase transitions to um, make this mechanism more beneficial. And uh, before we start, uh, I would like to make a few, um, give you a few reminders about how we, um, how we um, run the seminar series. Um, please keep yourself muted during Shalu's presentation, and if possible, also turn your video off um, um, for bandwidth reasons. Uh, you will surely have uh, various interesting questions that uh, we would like you to hold until the Q&A session at the end of the seminar. And uh, once we start the Q&A session, uh, you can pose your questions using either the chat function of um, Zoom or um, by raising your hand um, or by simply unmuting yourself and, um, and posing um, your question. I also want to remind everybody that this uh, presentation and the discussion is, is being recorded. I guess that's all. Um, Shalu, why don't you take it away? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank Professor Jem Tashan again for the kind introduction, and I thanks everyone for taking time to sit in this presentation. Uh, my name is Shalu. I'm a fourth year grad student in Professor Jem Tashan's group. And today I would like to talk about tuning nanoscale phase transitions to expand transformation induced plasticity. And to start with, I, I would like to share you with a diagram that is um, showing the relative importance versus the date for all kinds of materials in our uh, common life. As we will see that metals and alloys have been mankind's most essential structural materials ever since the Bronze Age. However, in recent years, the quick emerging nanotechnology have triggered the investigation of all kinds of new materials such as nanocomposites. And um, one good example is graphene that you have seen in previous series of this MIT nano exploration that by tuning the lower dimensional structure of graphene, our researchers have demonstrated the great improvement of physical properties in this nanomaterial. However, how about the steels? which are mankind's most essential structural materials and witness millions of tons of production per year. The surprising thing is that this material has also been nano for several thousand years. So if we're, if we're going to take the simple example of this cable state bridge, so if, it, if I'm going to cut a small piece of this cable and put it in, inside my microscope, what I will see is a nano composite consists of an alternating layer of cementite and ferrite resulting from a eutectoid transformation, giving us a nanostructured pearlite. And all kinds of phase transitions in steels have gave rise to various kinds of nanostructures, which enable us to further tune the mechanical properties of the steels in a block scale. However, there's one kind of phase transitions that is of particular interest in steel metallurgy, that is the martensitic transformation that have been discovered by German metallurgist Martens back to, back to the 18th century. So what he proposed is that if we manage to quench a metastable austenite at a very, relatively fast cooling speed, what we will get is a nanostructured materials consisting of all kinds of fine, fine structure, for example, twins, and you hear, here you see the lenticular twins within the martensite. And because of the high cooling speed and the transformation sequence of the martensite, in, in terms of steel design, what, what we ended up with is this martensitic steels with relatively high strength, but limited ductility because of the high defect concentra concentration. However, apart from thermal quenching, the other way to uh, manipulate martensitic transformation is to use plastic straining. For example, if we tune the, tune the chemistry of our alloy in an extent that the martensite start, start stress is higher than the parent, uh, is higher than the ail strength of the parent phase, what we will get in terms of the mechanical properties is that we will get enormous amount of increase in our fracture elongation, but still maintaining a decent amount of 
fracture elongation, as you see from this curve. So this effect, which making use of the strain-induced Martin Citrix transformation, is documented as the transformation-induced plasticity effect trip. And by using this technology, you see from this Ashby chart that the trip assisted materials is indeed having a better improvement of strength and ductility synergy. And in the literature, there have been also an enormous amount of effort going on to further optimize the trip effect. For example, using the texture of the parent osnite, making the grain size uh, smaller of the osnite to manipulate the mechanical stability. Or one can also do a temper treatment to uh, design a so-called trip maraging steels. However, one central problem is still lying there for the trip assisted materials, that is, the trip effect will actually terminate with respect to the consumption of the osnite. So that being said, the trip effect by itself is a good uh, phenomenon. However, the resulting transformation product, that is the Martin side, is having a strain hardenability hard discrepancy with respect to the adjacent osnite and giving rise to micro damage nucleation, such as quasi cleavage cracking or boundary decohesion cracking. So this inevitably imposes an intrinsic limit of the trip effect. That is, the transformation product of the Martin side is giving rise to the a micro, a micro scale um, source for damage nucleation. However, if we take a look back at the literature, that while this trip assisted materials is keeping, <clears throat> is keeping attracting broad attention, there's limited focus being imposed with the strain induced Martin side. That is the intrinsic limitation of hindering the further promotion of the mechanical performances of trip assisted alloys. So what we, what, what we can do further with the strain induced Martin side. So this is the central interest of, the, of today's topic that we are going to talk about two proposed strategies at two length scales aiming to further in, expand the transformation induced plasticity. So I'll be starting with the first strategy that is to uh, having the same philosophy of the transformation-induced plasticity effect, that is to introduce a secondary displacive phase transformation mechanism in the Martin site that has been induced by plastic straining. And then the very first question to think is what type of Martin site that we would like to work with? So namely, which transformation pathways to work with? So in the metallurgy textbook, there are two kinds of Martin cytic transformation pathway that we can seek for. So first is the FCC to BCT transformation, and the second is the FCC to HCP transformation. So here's a demonstration of the in situ TEM result. As you can see that by increasing the amount of plastic straining, the FCC to BCT transformation is having a severe amount of plastic accommodation in the vicinity of the Martin site. Whereas the HCP Martin site, by contrast, is having a more moderate plastic strain accommodation. So this is also documented in the theory of Martin Cytic transformation because the BCT Martin Cytic transformation is involving with vein deformation, a rigid body rotation, and a lattice invariant shear, which is a huge amount of plastic accommodation in the vicinity. However, for HCP Martin side, because of the similar stacking sequence between the HCP lattice and the FCC lattice, our habit plane is fixed as 111. And that is why we see a more moderate plastic accommodation in HCP Martin site. And that is why in this particular direction, we would like to proceed with the HCP Martin site for our investigation. So to test the hypothesis that whether or not we can introduce a secondary displacive transformation in this Martin site that has been induced by plastic straining, we start with the iron manganese cobalt chromium alloy and perform an in situ SEM straining experiment at a quasi-static strain rate. And here's how the um, experiment look like. And what we proceed, as we proceed straining, what we will see is the nucleation of this band-like HCP Martin site. And if we keep an eye on the region number one and number two and perform an in situ EBSD analysis, what we will see is that in region number one, surprisingly, we have the phase transformation cycle going from an FCC phase through plastic straining, promote a HCP Martin site nucleation. And upon further straining with a <clears throat> plastic strain level around 14%, what we get is a final 
FCC phase being nucleated within the HCP band that has been induced by prior straining. And we focus on number region number two, what we get is a normal FCC to HCP single transformation induced plasticity effect. So this in situ experiment seemingly suggests that if we manage to further increase the plastic strain level, as you see here, we can not only nucleate a HCP Martin site, but also trigger a secondary phase transformation within the HCP Martin site to promote a second HCP to FCC phase transformation. So this is also across supported by a more recent study using the in situ TEM result. So what you, what you see here is these researchers strain a piece of thin fall sample, and then they see the nucleation of the HCP Martin site, and upon further plastic straining, the contrast produced by the HCP band diminished. So that means we trigger the FCC to HCP to FCC sequential Martin state transformation by monotonic plastic straining. And this further leads to our further discussion of what are the mechanical benefits of the dual trip effect making use of a FCC to HCP to FCC transformation cycle. And in order to understand this question, we employ a technique called micromechanical digital image correlation, which enable us to measure the, the plastic strain accommodated by different micro, microstructural constitute. And this diagram look a bit complicated. Actually on the X axis is the global plastic strain level we apply to the material. And, the, and on the Y axis is the microstructural plastic strain accommodated by the different constituent of the microstructure. And in this diagram, we are measuring three components of the plastic strain. First is the plastic strain accommodated by the HCP Martin site. And second is the plastic strain accommodated by the FCC phase transformed from this dual trip mechanism. And third part is the untransformed FCC phase, which witness perfect dislocation drive. So as you can see here is a one demonstration of the Martin site being nucleated at around a plastic strain level of uh, 5%. So this amount of increase is the transformation strain that is accommodated by the first FCC to HCP transformation. So upon further plastic straining, what you will see is in this diagram is the plastic transformation rate and plastic strain amount being accommodated by the transformation is witnessing a decreased amount, which is because of the strain hardening contribution from the untransformed FCC part. However, the key information in this diagram is we plot this curve, which documented the dual trip region that undergoes an FCC to HCP to FCC transformation. So the two core information here is the second transformation from HCP to FCC from this dot to this dot. As you can see that upon this transformation, there's still an incrementation of plastic strain level, which means quite like the first transformation that the secondary displacive transformation from HCP to FCC is also accommodating plastic strain. And the second key information is upon the nucleation of the final FCC phase, if we further increase our global plastic deformation level, this FCC phase can further undergo plastic deformation meaning that the final FCC phase provided is high defect constant can still accommodate plastic strain. And the further examination of the plastic strain at a transverse direction also shows that the secondary FCC to HCP transformation is witnessing a more pronounced compression effect. And second discussion of this part is we would like to further under Stan, what is the underlying transformation mechanism for this interesting FCC to HCP to FCC transformation cycle? And to understand that, we firstly give a small, um, very quick uh, overview of what, what has been done in the literature. That is the very famous uh, model uh, by Professor Greg Olson and Professor Morris Cohen, uh, based on the assumption of partial uh, of mono partial emission. So in their model, they conceived that the strain-induced FCC to HCP transformation is a sort of plastic deformation module that is competing with a perfect dislocation glide. And upon plastic straining, the Shockley partial dislocation will witness a monodirectional emission. And upon, the every, upon, every, upon gliding on the every other plane of the 111 plane in FCC phase, 
this HCP Martin site managed to grow and finally uh, uh, achieving the FCC to HCP transformation. And this has been also reported in the literature at the nanoscale, uh, trying to explain how the second transformation is being accomplished. So it was proposed that this transformation can be occurred in two pathways. Number one is the, when the leading partial moved to the trailing partial, it will result in the final FCC structure. And the second scenario is when the trailing partial catch up with the leading partial, and it, it will also manage to recover the FCC phase. And in our study, we will next assess the monopartial assumption via crystallographic con consideration, mechanics consideration, and thermodynamic assessment. So first at first, from a crystallographic con consideration, if the leading partial is catching up the trailing partial that gave rise to the final FCC phase, what we will see crystallographically is the final FCC orientation should be exactly the same as the parent FCC orientation. However, if, if it is the trailing partial being catched up with the leading partial, what we will see is that the final FCC phase will yield a <clears throat> sigma-3 coherent twin boundary relationship with respect to the parent FCC phase. However, when we look at our data, quite, it occurs quite surprising that there's the, the, the new FCC phase is having a completely different crystallographic orientation with respect to the parent FCC phase. And there's no twin relationship between the new FCC phase and the final FCC phase. However, what is more interesting is that we indeed see the twin orientation relationship <clears throat> between two new FCC lamellae. That, that being said that the new FCC phase being finally formed is not a single crystal. It is having a sigma-3 coherent twin boundary. So this says that the, the monopartial emission model cannot work to explain the crystallographic feature of the, FC, of the HCP to FCC final transformation. So how about the mechanics consideration? So if it's the case when the leading partial moves the trailing partial, what we would expect from the transformation strain is that the forward transformation strain will be exactly the same as the second transformation strain when the FCC phase go back, when the HCP phase go back to FCC. However, if it's the case when the trailing partial moves to the leading partial, this transformation strain will be equal among and also their absolute value is equal. However, when we look at our digital image correlation data, is that this transformation strain from the HCP phase to the final FCC phase is not the amount of transformation strain being accommodated by the first transformation, because otherwise we will see this data point way up high to somewhere here. And it is also not the first situation when the leading partial catch up with the trailing partial, because in that, in that situation, this data point will go back to zero. So this again says that the monopartial emission model cannot explain the mechanics feature of the HCP FCC transformation. And finally, how about the thermodynamic consideration? When we apply a plastic strain being, uh, being applied a plastic strain to the microstructure, the FCC phase undergo a transformation to the HCP phase. So if we are going to claim that it is the monopartial emission model that explain the second transformation, this means that we apply the plastic strain as this, and this, this state function will be reversed to the parent state, which violate the second law of thermodynamics. So that means that there should be an additional reason that is accommodating the second transformation. So we start our investigation by an in situ synchrotron X-ray re results, which for example, on the left, you see no additional structure being observed during plastic deformation. And the second plot on the right-hand side shows the annihilation of stacking faults within the parent FCC phase. So these two combined feature with the consideration of the classical monopartial emission model seemingly suggest a random partial emission model being, uh, being taking place in the plastic deformation that gave rise to the HCP to FCC transformation. So this model would like to, would work as the follows. Depending on the plastic strain level, the, the Shockley partial B1 and B2 and B3 can both be emitted in almost equal amount. So, which is quite like this, this animation. And under this random partial emission model, if we nucleate B1, B2, and B3 in almost equal amount, we can firstly accommodate a, 
this the final HCP to FCC transmission. And we, we can also manage to explain the thermodynamic feature. That is, when we further apply the plastic strain level, we are going to further bias the skip energy landscape, giving rise to this final FCC phase. And note here that our X coordinate should be the accumulative amount of atomistic displacement along the partial dislocation shear direction. And under this random partial emission model, we can also seemingly uh, very plausibly explain why there's a twin structure being nucleated within the final FCC phase. So this is the first strategy that we propose, that is to introduce a secondary phase transmission mechanism in this uh, Martin site being nucleated by plastic straining. And the second mechanism that we are going to discuss today is by mechanical faulting. So remember the scenario that we have discussed earlier that, uh, that the HCP Martin site is nucleated through the formation of an intrinsic stacking fault because we are going to nucleate Shockley partial. And if the Shockley partial is managed to glide on every other 111 plane, we will finally witness a blocky HCP Martin site formation, which has been documented as the origin of micro damage. However, a rational thinking would be that what, what would be the case if we manage to mitigate HCP Martin site formation by sufficiently stabilizing our stacking fault? So this means that we are going to make the HCP Martin site infinitely thin, such that we stabilize layers of stacking faults. So our question becomes, can mechanical faulting play the major role in terms of plastic deformation? And in order to understand that, we employ a cobalt chromium tungsten nickel alloy and apply a plastic deformation. And much to our surprise that this alloy is behaving, uh, is having a much better strength ductility synergy than the classical precipitation strength and super alloy. And the previous iron manganese alloy witnessed a blocky HCP Martin site transformation. When we further look into the deformation substructure using integrated EBSD, ECCI, and digital image correlation technique is that instead of the edge dislocation or screw dislocation, what we observe at the, as the uh, defects being generated by plastic deformation are these planar-like features which witness uh, an, an unsymmetric contrast on the, ad, on, on the one end and a decaying contrast on the other end. So by com comparing the ECCI contrast between what we observed in the pre present material and blocking HCP Martin site and perfect dislocation glide, what we conclude is that in, in this material, we indeed planar-like features and, anti and, and unsymmetric contrast being, being able to confirm that we indeed form extensive amount of uh, stacking force by plastic straining. And this leads to the uh, a further question, which what are the evolutionary features of stacking faults during plastic deformation? And in order to understand that, we employ the in-situ synchrotron X-ray technique. We apply a plastic deformation and shedding a synchrotron X-ray on the sample, measuring how the lattice strain is, a change, is changing as we increase the plastic strain level. So what we have seen in the axial direction and the radial direction is that in the axial direction, we have an increase of the lattice strain with respect to increased amount of plastic straining. However, in the radial, radial direction, because of the Poisson, Poisson contraction effect, the lattice strain is witnessed a compression amount. So much to our in, in surprising is the discrepancy between the lattice strain of 111 plane and 222 plane. As we know from crystallographic symmetry is that 111 and 222 belongs to the same a reflection unit being said that if there's no planar defects, 111 and 222 lattice strain will be exactly the same. However, why we are having a, such a large discrepancy in both the axial and radial direction, we go back to our diffraction theory, which says that the nominal amount of lattice strain measured from the synchrotron actually consists of the contribution of the symmetric part. And the anti-symmetric part which is, which is due to the formation of planar faults. Then we calculate the stacking fault probability. And what we see from the synchrotron measurement is that the, upon plastic straining, this material witnessed an evident increase of stacking fault probability. 
meaning that the strain hardening contribution is provided by the nucleation of extensive amount of stacking faults during plastic deformation. As you see that upon the increment of the strain hardening exponent, the distance of the stacking faults also, also witness an almost like an exponential decrease. That means by nucleating a, a high density amount of stacking faults, this material undergoes a significant amount of strain hardening. So the next question is, what could be the mechanistic origin of this mechanical faulting response? So this will be a relatively long discussion. So we would like to pose our explanation first that this behavior is plausibly related with a negative intrinsic stacking fault energy. So what does this mean? So this means that if we're going to firstly consider how the stacking fault structure is being uh, maintained at the equilibrium state, from the textbook, we understand if the intrinsic stacking fault energy is positive, the stacking fault structure will be held by the force equilibrium between the pitch color force and the contraction force balanced by the stacking fault ribbon. In the case of in negative intrinsic stacking fault energy, what we will have is both the pitch color force and the stacking fault ex uh, ex ribbon will provide a repulsive force. So this amount will, in our presumption will be balanced by the lattice frictional force. And in order to test the hypothesis of this negative intrinsic stacking fault energy, we employ a thermodynamic modeling, which calculate the intrinsic stacking fault energy. As you can see that in this material through the thermodynamic modeling, the intrinsic stacking fault energy being hinted by the thermodynamic model is way negative at a room temperature. So what does this mean? So what is the mechanical implications of a negative intrinsic stacking fault energy? So what we learned from the textbook for a positive intrinsic stacking fault energy case is when we apply an elastic loading, we are going to extend the stacking fault uh, length. And we, if we remove the elastic load, the leading partial and trailing partial will both move, move back. And this has been confirmed from an in situ ECCI analysis that the positive intrinsic stacking fault energy will lead to a shrinkage of stacking faults when we apply the elastic loading and loading experiment. So what about the cases for a in negative intrinsic stacking fault energy? That is the consequences of negative stacking fault in, intrinsic stacking fault energy will be the cases that first, if the, in, ne, if the intrinsic stacking fault energy is way negative, we're going to activate a discrete motion of partial dislocation. And second, the stacking fault extension, if compared with the positive intrinsic stacking fault energy case, will witness an irreversible extension if we apply a elastic loading and unloading experiment. And the third, third consequence is that discrete motion of partial dislocation can become possible in the present material. And the, and the last two hypotheses will enable an in situ ECCR experiment for mechanistic validation. So here's how the experiment look like. We firstly pre-deform our sample to around 2% plastic strain, nucleate the extensive amount of stacking fault as you see in the previous slide. And then we are going to monitor the density of the stacking fault trace change as we apply an elastic loading and un unloading experiment. So in the global statistical assessment, as, as you see in this experiment, what we see is that when we increase our elastic loading, the stacking faults length witness an increase. However, when we remove the external loading, the total amount of stacking fault density in this monitored region persists its value, even when the plastic loading is removed. So this is the global statistics. And we further move on to the local activity of the stacking faults. As you can see that if we apply a loading in the first column, both stacking fault ribbons witness a, an evident increase in their length. However, when we remove the external loading, the length of these two stacking fault ribbons remains their value being unchanged. So quantitatively sketched here that in this particular material upon elastic loading and unloading experiment, what we will see, what we what we have seen is the stacking fault extension, it witnessed a highly irreversible characteristic. And their length and their total amount witnessed an invariable value 
even when the elastic load is being removed. So that is consistent with our hypothesis that if the in intrinsic stacking for energy is way negative, what we will expect is a predominant amount of stacking fault nucleation. And also the stacking fault extension when we apply a plastic uh, elastic strain <clears throat> is highly irreversible. So up to now, we have proposed two strategies at two length scales to further explain the plastic uh, transformation induced plasticity effect. First through a introducing a secondary displacive transformation mechanism in the um, HCP Martin site being nucleated by plastic straining. And the second strategy is at an even smaller length scale down to one layer of atomistic planar force. That is to nucleate mechanical faulting down to the down to the scale of nanometer, which enables a more evident increase of strength and ductility combination. So to end this uh, presentation as a final concluding remark, that if we look back at this diagram again, that metals and alloys have been mankind's most essential structural materials for several thousand years. However, if we really look down and narrow down our investigation length scale to nano or micrometer level, we indeed can, can introduce further mechanism to promote the property, property combination at a microscopic level. So this is, a, 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 again, a very good demonstration of the very famous quote of uh, physicist Richard Feynman, that there's plenty of room at the bottom. So with this, I think I would like to stop here and conclude my talk. So I would like to thank the Argo National Laboratory for the synchrotron X-ray diffraction source and thank my colleagues for the valuable uh, experimental support and discussion. And finally, I, I would like to thank our uh, very amazing uh, group members for their various supports in this, uh, in this direction. So with this, I conclude my talk and I thank you very much for coming here and ready to take any question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Shalu, for um, um, for the detailed insights about these uh, interesting mechanisms. From from my perspective, I think two points are really important to emphasize. One is that you know steels. We've been working on steels for a long, long time, and as you start looking closer, there are so many new opportunities in still in, in making much better um, much better um, steels. And the second, I think, is a is a sort of a background theme here in terms of, um, you know, characterization, as you've seen in shallow slides many times in situ characterization techniques popping up, uh, unraveling otherwise complex mechanisms. Um, and so I think um, this is also an, an, an uh, characterization uh, aspect that needs to be highlighted from this very nice talk. Thanks, shallow. All right, so uh, let's turn to the audience here. Um, and um, start the Q&A. So as, um, as I announced at the beginning, you may pose your questions over the chat, using the chat, or raising your hand, or just simply unmuting yourself. OK, I see one question in, uh, in the chat already. That's by Feng. Hey, and Feng says, um, if, the, if the sequential martensic transformation will play a role in the trip effect, uh, he's wondering whether that's the case. And uh, he's especially wondering the role about the second phase transformation. So that's the HCP to FCC transformation in the strain hardening uh, response. Shall we? Yeah, great. So, uh, Fong, thanks a lot for coming here for the presentation. And actually, that's a good question. So <clears throat> currently, what we have learned from the in situ straining experiment is that the plastic strain, the, so the final FCC phase is of high defect con content, so, but it managed to accommodate plastic strain. However, if you compare the slope of this curve, so this uh, blue, blue dots, the curve, the, the slope of this curve is 0.4, which is smaller than the plastic strain incrementation uh, with uh, measured for, for the HCP phase. So that being said, this phase is um, mechanically harder than the HCP phase transformed by the first trip effect from the plastic strain measurement. However, I think um, this is an indirect support that this, this um, phase is, is so 
by nucleating the final FCC phase, we are introducing an even stronger phase in the microstructure, but it still managed to um, accommodate plastic strain. However, I think there's still one more step to fully understand this uh, question, that is to measure the phase stress accommodation by different microstructural constituents. So what I think in this direction, if we would like to proceed, is that we can make use of the more um, high resolution X-ray, such as a 3D X-ray to measure the full stress tensor being accommodated by different microstructural constituents. And then the accommodated phase stress can be extrapolated. And it, that information, if being combined with this plastic strain measurement can fully understand the strain hardening contribution of the second transformation. But that, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks. Thank so. you. Thank you, Zalu. Um, any other questions from the audience? Let's see one more. Yeah, Zhang Cheng is asking, what is the difference between stressed in, stress induced martensic transformation and strain induced martensic transformation? Yes. Uh, hi, Chang. Uh, thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> I think this definition is based on um, Professor Greg Olson's uh, famous diagram. So when we say a martensitic transformation is induced by stress or rigorously assisted by stress, that means the martensitic transformation is occurring before the yielding of the parent austenite, as you see here. So this, this, this part means the martensitic transformation start before the yielding of your parent austenite. So in this situation, what you will normally see is a plateau in the, in the engineering stress strain curve before the plastic yielding of the, <clears throat> of the parent phase. And we, if we say a martensitic transformation is induced by plastic straining, that means the parent austenite will firstly undergo a microscopic yielding. So there will be some amount of perfect dislocation glide. And the strain hardening contribution of the parent phase is going to trigger the total amount of stress needed for nucleating a martensite. And that is why we term martensite taking place in the plastic region using the term strain-induced martensite. But for pseudo-elasticity or shape memory effect, we say the martensite is assisted by elastic stress. So that, that's a very good conceptual question. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, other questions from the audience? So Shalu, I have a question. So can you comment more on the tuning of this second transformation? Because of course you and I discussed this a lot, but um, perhaps this discussion is also interesting for the audience here. Yeah. So you you like the normal trip effect, like the normal mechanically transform uh, uh, mechanically induced martensitic transformation. You don't want this capability to be consumed too early. Um, yeah. You you also don't want it to be delayed so much that it almost never happens. Uh, yeah. or maybe it's too late when it happens. Um, and the relative contributions of this uh, strain hardening contributions of the two transformations will be different. And yes. Their environments will be different. So it seems like a difficult optimization problem here. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that, that that's, um, that's a very good question. So <clears throat> I think that this also depends on our operating plastic deformation micromechanism. So we want to more evenly spread these uh, two, two transformations at different uh, plastic strain level. So I think uh, <clears throat> a more um, comprehensive study should be done in both a thermodynamic pathway, which we managed to optimize the stability of these um, transformation at different microstructural constituent by using alloying element. So the second, Second strategy that I'm thinking of is through uh, microstructural um, mod modulation. For example, we can impose a strong texture in the parent austenite that, that managed to delay some of the transformation and push them to the later stage of the deformation. And also we can, what else we can think of is um, also use the grain size effect that because grain size will play a critical role in the mechanical stability 
of the parent austenite. So we, we shall always aiming to avoid the birth, uh, avoid the burst like uh, kinetics of phase transmission and spread them more evenly. So what I'm thinking as a final pathway to optimize this is we can seek for other displaced phase transition modules which may not be um, strain induced. So they can, they, they should be displacive, but they can also be accommodated by atomic shuffle, such as um, a twinning in HCP phase. They do not necessarily need to be uh, strain induced. So they can be atomic shuffle, but they are still accommodating plastic strain. So this is a sort of a mechanical metallurgy strategy to further optimize the, the strain hardening contribution. Thank you. All right, um, maybe a final question from the audience. So Yemin is asking Shalu um, about the Martensic transformation. So he says, I would like to know, will the Martensic transformation release the strain of the parent phase and to what extent? So if there's any kind of relaxation associated with it. If I understand the question correctly, this should be, um, they should be asking whether or not the martensitic transformation is releasing the stress, not, not strain. Because if we have a martensitic yes. transformation by displacive and it's a shear dominant procedure, we are promoting plastic strain because we are having uh, this amount of strain incrementation due to the shear event of the plastic deformation. So if, if the question I understand correctly is, is that going to release stress? Then the question is yes, because this phase transformation mechanism, as you know, that it is a stress delocalization procedure. It is going to remove any further, um, it is going to remove stress concentrators within the microstructure by promoting this amount of plastic strain incrementation. So, that is my understanding. So it is not going to release plastic strain, but it is going to lead to stress. Uh, it's going to release stress concentrators within the microstructure. That is why you can trigger this Martin City transformation. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Yumin. Thanks, Shalu. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, sorry. I, what I mean is that will the Martin City transformation influence the lattice strain? Will it release? or just release the, let the parent phase, the lattice strain of the parent phase to decrease. Okay, so if your that question you is, um, is about lattice strain, then I think my answer is yes, because there will be a uh, low partitioning between the FCC phase and the HCP phase. So depending on the modulars and the hardness of HCP and FCC phase, there will be a release of lattice strain in, in the parent uh, austenite. But the total amount of plastic strain you measured from the microstructural land scale is always increasing. So this is a, I think these, these are two different, uh, different strain uh, concepts. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, is there any maybe final question from the audience? Final, final question doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, then I would like to thank Shalo again and all the attendees um, for this lively discussion. And I uh, want to remind everybody again that this is the last seminar of the semester uh, for the MIT Nano Seminars. And we are definitely looking forward to restarting this in the new semester. Thank you.